Welcome to today's webcast, brought to you by DataVail. I'm Stephen Fegg, Director at Database Trends and Applications in Unisphere Research. I will be your host for today's broadcast. Our presentation today is titled, Instrumentation with Splunk. Before we begin, I want to explain how you can be a part of this broadcast. There will be a question and answer session. If you have a question during the presentation, just type it into the question box provided and click on the submit button. We'll try to get to as many questions as possible, but if your question has not been selected during the show, you will receive an email response. Now, to introduce our speaker for today, John Kennan, Senior Oracle EBS DBA at DataVail. Now I'm going to pass the event over to John. Thanks, Stephen. Hi, everybody, and thanks for taking a slice of time to watch this webinar. Um, my name is John Kennan. I'm Senior Oracle EBS DBA at DataVail. I've been doing Oracle Apps DBA work for over 15 years and specialize in custom instrumentation and solutions for performance tuning. And one of my favorite tools to use is Splunk, which we're going to go into in a little more detail today. So today's topic is mining KPI data with Splunk. Like I said, i um, been an Oracle Apps DBA for over 15 years, specialize in automating KPA, KPI collections for performance tuning, and I work for DataVail, who was founded in 2001. We're based in Broomfield, Colorado. We have nearly 500 DBAs, and we're the largest remote DBA service provider in North America. We service pretty much all the platforms, Oracle, Oracle EPS, SQL Server, it's pretty much got a database, we can handle it. What does Splunk do? Well, Splunk is a cross-platform performance monitoring framework that can, when properly implemented, forward log data from multiple sources to a central index, and I'll go over more of these in detail as, as we go forward in this demo, execute commands to pull and forward live performance data from multiple apps to a central index, provide a cross-web reporting analysis and alerting tool, and be trained to recognize key metrics and provides quick and easy ad hoc mining tool. And the one thing I'd like to stress that Splunk is a framework, meaning it's somewhere in between a platform like a, like a SolarWinds, for example, which has plugins and whatnot, and on the other end of the spectrum would be your open source tools like Elasticsearch you know, or Hadoop or something you would, you would roll yourself. Splunk provides uh, the, the query tools, the graphic tools, the collection tools, the redundancy tools for you to um, be able to spin up what you need without having to write everything from scratch. So it's a, it's a supported platform. So basically, in a nutshell, what I, like, what I like to tell folks is as long as it writes a file or goes to standard out, Splunk can take in the data and help you extract your KPIs from it. Doesn't matter what version of your software is running on Splunk at that point. Doesn't even know what it's looking at. Like it doesn't care about what Oracle versions that you have. If it's running on a Windows box or Solaris box, all it looks for is standard out or log files, and it will take them in. And you get to classify what they are, and then you get to write custom reports around your KPIs around them, not how the software vendor wants you to do it. So that's why I like Splunk, because it's a very flexible tool. So we'll get into that, Splunking your data and what we do with Splunk. As I said before, Splunk's framework comes with some really neat features that will allow you to roll your own Splunking application. So it has its own search language and a UI offering some awesome interactive drill down tools. And in a bit, we'll go into a live demo of Splunk to show you these in action. But up here, you can see that Splunk's got an indexing or search language. You can see I'm looking through an index for some specific things from specific hosts. And then it's going to report and find out, you know, basically how many of these things it's found on a quick little speed chart, which, again, we can, that's interactive, and I can show you how that works a little bit later on. And while it's doing that, it also tries to collect as much information as it can. Like, for example, you can see it's tracking host. So because um, Splunk had its forwarders, and again, we'll, we'll go into how Splunk captures data on specific servers, but since the forwarder resides on this server, it knows automatically that this information came from this server. So you can see for this particular event, the 500 server had the most of them. So if this was a 
problem I was troubleshooting, I would probably want to look at this node first because it seems to be having the worst issues. So again, this is a, something that automatically comes up you know, with the search GUI tool that Splunk has. So it really helps you do some dynamic drill downs when something's on fire. It's a great way to go through parse your logs and see, and see what the problem is. To go a little deeper, Splunk uses regex field extractions to actually look for patterns in your data and, and classify them. So here's a little regex that looks, uh, actually this one will look through um, a Java trace file and pick out the different class delimitations. So you can look for specific things like, you know, IO, you know, java.lang. whatever. It will break those up and, and turn them into searchable variables that you can then write reports on. So again, you're, this is where you're writing it yourself. You're not, you're not stuck with what the vendor gives you and what the vendor will let you search for. You get to write your own searches in Splunk. And Splunk has some pretty neat tools to help you do this graphically in case regex isn't your thing. And, and I admit that I always have to hit Google pretty hard when I'm writing new ones because unless you do this stuff every day, it's not friendly. But Splunk does have tools to help you out. So once your data is in and you've done field extractions, it's long, you know you can classify them and name them as fields. So here's um, here's an example of we were pulling in um, we were pulling in some data from from an RMAN query that I had, which is Oracle's uh, backup utility, and we'll be going into a live demo on how to make an RMAN monitoring tool with Splunk. And so since this came from query, uh, it was already comma delimited, and so Splunk will automatically broke out the fields for me without having to write in any regex. As you can see, I was able to select comma, and it's splitting out all the fields. And so these are the different uh, values from that RMAN query that I wrote. <laughs> Splunk also has some powerful data classification tools. Not only does it do the stuff I automatically showed you, like host and file name and whatnot, but once you've classified your data, these uh, values, key value pairs, become available to you to roll in to reports and, and, call, and, and construct what they call knowledge objects, um, which is primarily a, a data model. And we'll go into building a data model later on as well. But basically, this allows you to, to pull in the key the KPIs that you're interested in, and you can actually use it to make an interactive pivot chart and graphical charts as well. So, and again, we'll, we'll go through these in step by step during the live demo. Um, so here's an example of an interactive pivot point where, uh, again, I've, uh, because my RMAN query, these are the database names, so again, they were automatically classified from the query. And so I basically told this, this tool that I want to split the columns on the database name and I want to split the rows by slices of time. And now we have an a interactive drill down chart that tells me at what time and how much data was being written to the RMAN tape system for any given instance in their environment. So this is a really handy tool to have. Because again, as you can see, Splunk was just tracking it over time. But you can actually use this to, to predict usage. You know, if you, if you need to expand and get, you know, if you're, if you're in the cloud, you might need to get another 10. 10 gigs or something, you know, because um, you're starting to, you know, your trending is to be more data. So it's a, it's a lot, it's a better way to, to actually track what you're using and give you a, a view ahead of time rather than rather than acting reactively. You can be proactive about it and, and watch for your usage reports there. So then once it's in here, you can also, this is really, where it really steps out, is you can make it into an interactive pivot chart as well, all automatically. These are using the tools of, of Splunk's charting. Um, that come with it. So again, you don't have to, you know, this isn't an elastic search, you know, custom stuff. This is all the interactive point and click tools that Splunk gives you. And you have a lot of options. You can do sums and fields and what kind of scale you'd like. So this one is actually, I kind of like using this one because you can see here on Saturdays, they got, you know, they've got a lot of traffic, you know, that happens in a particular day. And so, you know, they might want to schedule something a little bit earlier on Saturday, you know, uh, earlier on in the week because, you know, it's been pretty dead up to here. And so, you know, they're having point of contention where there's a lot of resources being used all at once. And so this, you know, again, can be used for capacity planning. And, and this is something of you that you normally might not see, uh, you know, this pattern. So Splunk really makes things uh, obvious to you when you put it in graphical form. And, you, and you'll see things that you didn't notice, like, for example, you know, the traffic jam here that they've got on Saturday. 
So we're going to, before we go into how Splunk collects data, I promised that we do a little bit of live drill down. So I'll show you kind of recap on, on some of the on some of the tools we've talked about here. So I'm going to switch screens. It'll take a couple seconds here. So now this is the familiar, I'm a little trouble with my mouse here. There we go. So now this is a familiar search uh, screen that I showed you earlier. So again, I'm searching through indexes, and I'll explain what an index is later. And source type, again, um, I get to catalog what kind of data I'm looking for. And so I was pulling in all the Java logs from, from some hosts. Actually, there's four of them, which ones we can see. They're 500, 501, 502. So it automatically tells me um, which, which hosts they come from. I can see which files I'm looking at. And here's one thing to note that Splunk when you get a file, it keeps the entire version of the file. All the contents of the file is in Splunk. You don't have to go to the server and cat and grep through it. So you even have to give logins to people to, to, to look at that. So again, it helps with your security. If you want to have you know level one or level two support, then maybe they want to look at this stuff, but they're not apps DBAs. You don't want them on the system. They don't have to go on the system to look through the logs now. They can just drill through Splunk, and a lot quicker too than actually grepping through the stuff and making a mess out of the log directories. So let's say they had an issue, and a lot of things that, that I would look for, like say there's a problem with that, and so uh, I would type everything ahead of time to so be a little quicker. So then I'm looking for error. I just put in a free text error, and you can see that Splunk's picking up all the issues where I've had errors. And you can see on this thing that there were 4,964 of them on this particular day. So you can see a couple here. So maybe an event started here and then really hit the wall. So you would start looking at maybe this area to see what happened what, and, and what errors are there. Because we're doing regex extractions, I've trained it. Remember that the thing I was telling you earlier with the class, you know, we saw that nasty regex. Well, this is what it populates. And I'm interested in the last thing after the dot, so broken pipe and connection reset. So these are pretty valuable things to take a look at. It could be a network issue. So you can filter on those. We just click on that. And now it goes in and looks for broken pipes. And you can see that's probably a good deal of them. So we can see which server has the most. This one does. So we can look at that. So now I'm looking at all the broken pipe errors on this server. And maybe let's see, there's a lot of them. 466 happen here. So we can double click on that. And now I'm honing in the search to that particular day. And now you can see it's changed by per hour. Well, you know, it looks like it maybe started getting a little high here at 29 events. So I'm going to drill in some more. You can see each time it's updating, it's updating the search for me. Now I can begin to do some debugging. And if I want to go right into the content of the file itself, that's easy too. I can just say show source. And Splunk will go through and highlight where in the log file that particular error is, and now I can scroll up and down to see what preceded it and what comes after it. So again, a really valuable tool without having to go to the server. Mind you, this is all pulling from Splunk's index. It's not pulling from the application server anymore, so I don't have to log in there. And in this particular environment, I've got eight app servers, each with eight JVMs, so I have 32 sets of log files that we're looking at, and we're very easily to be able to quickly drill down into one of them. So those are some of the tools that um, that Splunk has uh, for you when you're in the hot seat trying to debug things. You can also, as I said, create um, create the interactive reports and pivot charts. So again, um, we're using the example of the RMAN, and, and again, I'll show you how we collected this RMAN data later on when we actually get into to bringing in live data. But you can see now I'm looking for RMAN data. And you can see the interesting fields I showed you on that multicolored chart. Um, you can actually see that the, the, the columns are here. So here's all the databases that it's collecting. So again, it's automatically helped classify and filled in the key value pairs for me for my reports. So once I have it in this form, I can begin to make a data model, which is really simple. All we got to do is say, look for source type RMAN. Okay? And then I can say, all right, well, I want to add things to it. So I just click on Auto Extracted. And Splunk's going to take a look and see all of the, KP, or the key value pairs it's, it's, it's able to find. So all I have to do is click the ones that I want. I don't have time. That looks pretty good. 
Hit save. And there we have it. Now, if I want to do a pivot report, all I have to do is press pivot. Doing the search I just did. All right, now it comes up with our generic pivot chart. So, like I said before, I want to split the columns on database name. Add that to the table. All right, now I've got a list of all the databases and how many events it found, but this still isn't very helpful to me because at this point it's just finding out how many rows of data it found for each one of these things. And you know, we would like to we would like to be able to split it on time. So I can say split on time. And I'm going to pick days. I'm going to add that to the chart. Now it's a little better because we're splitting on time so we can see where we're not doing backups. We can see where we are. But still, this is just a count of how many rows it found, and that's still not very helpful. So we can have some math functions on here. Output bytes. I want to do a sum. I can add that to the table. And we're going to get rid of the count. And now we've got a chart that means something. These are the actual amount of bytes written per database at a particular time for the RMAN. Now, as you can see, we've got some graphical tools here. So I like this, but say I want to give something to management to show why I'm going to need some more resources available. I just hit column. And now we can see we have a columns there. I like this mode a little better. Stack is always good. They're fatter. So now we can see. And again, this is an interactive report. So if I did want to hone down for some reason on all of the data for that particular day for this guy, I would just have to click on him. I'll do it now. And it will go back to search. It writes a custom search for me and pulls in all the data for that server at that particular point in time. So again, you can always go back to the raw data you collected very quickly and then use this to modify your search. And this doing it this way actually will help you learn how to use Splunk search language because you can see all the commands are there for you and you can just cut and edit them as you wish and then save them if you like them. So you kind of learn as you go with Splunk. So it seems a little daunting at first, but it's, as soon as you start clicking around in some of the things and using the interactive charts and drill downs, you'll find out that you're also training yourself as well. Okay, I'm going to flip back. To our screen, we're going to get a little more about how we get data into Splunk. Now that we kind of see what data uh, does in Splunk and what Splunk does with your data, we're going to see how we can get it in there. So we'll go over Splunk's architecture first. And so Splunk consists of three major pieces. And for this demo, all three pieces are on, are on my box right now. Um, so I've got the forwarder, indexer, and search head all all on this one box for the demo. But these certainly can be split across multiple servers. Um, Splunk has all kinds of configurations for high availability, load balancing, so on and so forth. They've figured out a lot of the architecture for you. So again, you know, uh, it's a framework, but it's a rich framework. So if you wrote this, you're all you know, yourself in, like say, Elasticsearch, you'd also have to write in some way to make it redundant, some way to do it load balance, whereas Splunk has got this all covered for you and it's supported, right? So if there's an issue with, with the guts, then you just call Splunk support because you're more interested in getting your data out, not really learning how to write a search tool. So that's why I like Splunk a lot. And again, I just keep having to, to remind folks that that's what makes Splunk differently. It is a framework, so you get to you get to roll your own for whatever you have. It's, it's agnostic to what it's looking at. As long as it's got a file or a standard out, you can classify and index your data with Splunk, regardless of how old, how new, or whatever it is. So that's what makes Splunk very, very powerful. So we have what's called a forwarder. I've mentioned those before. Forwarder is a lightweight app that's installed on the server that you wish to monitor. Back in the example, if you remember, I showed you all the different hosts where data was coming from. Each one of those hosts has a forwarder. So you configure a forwarder to watch certain directories. So basically, there's an input file, and we'll go through how that works. And so I tell the forwarder to monitor these files or this directory. And if something new adds to the file or if a new file comes into the directory, send it to Splunk's indexer. All right, And then we get to tag it. We get to say, OK, and by the way, call this J2EE logs. and 
send the name of the host it came from. And so then all that stuff has been in, it has been cataloged for you so you can at least begin organizing your stuff rather than getting one giant bit bucket and trying to figure out what came from where. Splunk's already got it organized and telling you what it is and where it came from. And, oops. So the indexer itself. The indexer stores data from the forwarders into compressed proprietary file format. This is another important thing to remember that maybe Splunk's a little different than competitors like ArcSight and you know, runs on a, a SQL database of sorts. Splunk has a proprietary file-based database system that it uses. So um, it's not running on MySQL or, or you know, NoSQL or something. It's, it's its own proprietary file-based system that, and, it's, and it's heavily compressed and very efficient. So that's the indexer is basically just the directory structure of all of the files for that index. And an index is just a grouping of inputs. So you could have one big index. You could have an index for prod, an index for QA, or, or an index for department. However you want to organize it, it, it's up to you. So again, an indexing is just another way to classify your data. And then finally, the search head, which we've been looking at the most, that's where you, you, know, where you pop in the search language and do the GUIs, you know, do the charts and whatnot. So again, on this box, everything is on one, but you can have all these pieces for order indexer and search that on multiple boxes for an enterprise solution. So we're going to start with the forwarder and get a little more detail. So the forwarder is the beginning of classification. So that's where you peg out the source types, the host, and file names are collected and sent to the indexer already pre-cataloged. The forwarders are self-contained. This is what, I, in fact, Splunk itself is self-contained. So um, if you're running a Linux version of Splunk, you can get a tarball of, of Splunk. You can unpack it anywhere you want. A lot of times, you know, we don't have access to root, so we can't install it. But we, we can do things with the Oracle user. And so I have Splunk running as user Oracle in the Oracle home directory. Splunk does not put anything in your lib files at C or anything like that. It all it contains its own. It's completely self-contained. So um, and it doesn't use any ports below 1,000. So you could easily spin it up and run it wherever you want to, and as long as the user that you're running it with has access to read the files of the application that you're wanting to monitor, you're good to go. And the forwarders are the same way. They are self-contained. They don't have to be installed, and they can run as any OS user. So a lot of our forwarders are just, again, installed as the Oracle user in the Oracle home. And they, and they obviously, since the Oracle user is running them, they're able to read all of the files and run the SQL scripts that I'm using to collect this data. So it's a pretty quick install as far as that's concerned. And a little, and a little quick monitoring of, uh, uh, of your inputs.com file, which I'm showing here on, on the right. So, this is where you basically set up your monitoring sources. Like it says monitor um, all the OPMN. I want to call them OPMN logs. I want to send it to this index, and I want to ignore order than, older than seven days. Um, I recommend that you put this in. This is used for when you, if you're first starting. So like say you want to begin splunking your log files, and you've got log files you know, back to 1975. Unless you put this in, and or hold it to a date, Splunk will get all of them. And it'll take days and you'll blow up your, your uh, index license. Uh, because Splunk's indexing uh, is based on bytes per, per day. So how much does it log, how much data does it input till day? It doesn't care how much you save. It doesn't care if you never delete any of it. It doesn't care how long you keep it. It just cares about how many bytes pass through its indexer and that's what you pay for. So you can get a gig per day, 10 gigs per day, 50 gigs per day, et cetera. Splunk free comes with 500 megs a day, which is enough pretty much to, to do, you know, uh, you know, like, like a environment, like, you know, your production database server could probably easily get by for a proof of concept if you wanted to on the 500 megs a day. So you can see here, we're basically setting up, and so this is how the, the stuff is first classified telling the forwarder what to send to the indexer. So this is where, this is what I mean by the beginning of classification. Okay, so now we're going to get into a little more detailed demo of how I set up that, uh, that RMAN reporting uh, tool that, that we just looked at. So we're going to use something called scripted inputs. 
which is I, I made mention sort of to them. So uh, Splunk can also run scripts that produce standard out. So for a lot of things, like Oracle doesn't write that data I showed you to a file, right? It's, it, it's in a, it's a view that's queryable by the database. But I'm interested in seeing it, and I would like to catalog it. So we can write a SQL script and then have Splunk run that SQL script on five minute intervals, one day intervals, however you want, and capture the data because it's coming from standard out. So again, it doesn't matter what, there is no Oracle connector, Splunk's just writing a shell script, right? So you can write a shell script that will fire off a SQL command and get output from it, then Splunk can use it and use it to grab the data. It doesn't care what version of Oracle it's looking at or anything. Just as long as it can run the script, it can get the data. So these scripted inputs are pretty handy because obviously you can access things that's not available as an ordinary file, like top. You know, that would sit there and run. You could write a script that, that looks at top every two minutes and get your OS stats if you want to. Um, you can stream, uh, stream data from command line tools like SQL Plus, which is what we're going to look at. Also, if you've got some complex data that you, you maybe just need like the header of uh, of some batch files. You're not interested in, in the payload of them, but maybe you just want the header that says how long did they run, did they succeed or, or complete, you know, maybe the first 30 lines. You could write a scripted input in Perl just to grab the first 30 lines of this and send it to Splunk. So you're not indexing the whole the whole file like that. Like a good use of that is concurrent request logs in Oracle where that sometimes they can be huge and really I'm only interested in did it run, how did it end, you know, how long did it take. And so you can use a scripted input to do that and attach a timestamp to transient data such as IOSTAT. So if you're running IOSTAT and you'd like to collect IOSTAT 24-7, you can either stare at it yourself 24-7 or have Splunk stare at it for you and catalog your IOSTAT data as time goes on. And as you can see how easy it was to split things up by time. And then you can start doing trend reports that way. So this is information you normally would not have available to you, but could be very handy in case something did go wrong. You can go back and say, OK, well, what was my IOSTAT two hours you know, before this happened? Maybe IO was your issue. So Splunk will have that data for you. It's kind of like having a, you know, in one of those flight recorder boxes in a plane you know, collecting data before it crashes. So now we're going to talk about actually implementing the scripted input and a little more detail as to how Splunk set up. So this is a layout of a Splunk forwarder. So basically the Splunk home, I would just call this, I usually name it Splunk forwarder. And inside the Splunk forwarder is an Etsy and apps. Now granted, this is not your OS's Etsy directory. It's inside the forwarder. So it's, it's put up like a, a Linux Unix file system. So you'll be familiar with its layout. But again, it's not your OS's at C. It's inside the folder, all self-contained. So the scripts live in the bin directory, as you'd expect to find a bin. And then in default are where our configs live. And most of the ones we're interested in is inputs.conf. So basically, the steps are to create a shell script that's going to run the SQL script, create the SQL script, move the scripts into place, and then add the script stanza to the input in your inputs.conf file. So we'll talk about the SQL script again. Here on the left is a basic script. Put in all the stuff for SQL Plus to get the garbage out and just get a plain, plain query in. I'm selecting the, the information from the RC backup set details view that the, the RMAN catalog database has. And I'm telling it to I only want to capture um, the stuff for a day. And so I'm going to run my script for a day. And so that way I won't have any overlap. If you do get overlap, Splunk has some good dedupe tools that you can use to, to run through and, and so you don't get like the same event twice. You know, Splunk will pull that out for you. So you don't really have to go crazy, you know, ensuring that keeping track of when it was run last in case you skipped or if you ran it again, again by mistake, you know, you're not going to wreck your reports because, because Splunk can dedupe your data for you. And then we create a shell script that runs it. So basically, this is your, your standard. Um, one thing to remember, even if you are running as the Splunk user, I would always advise to make sure you're sourcing the proper profile and environment in case you've got multiple environments uh, on your box, uh, you know, just to make sure that you're getting the right one. And then we do SQL plus silent. And again, we don't have to use silent. Splunk could filter out the stuff that it doesn't doesn't need, but then that would get sent to the indexer and why pay for stuff, the header stuff that you're not going to need. So basically, it's just going to run the SQL script that I've made and saved. So 
And then this is an example of some of the output. Here's the column headers. Again, Splunk was smart enough to know that the first line contains names because it looks for stuff like that. And so it'll help make assumptions that, okay, you know, I've got, you know, X amount of, of columns per file, and therefore I'm going to see if the first one looks like column headers. And if it is, that's what I'm going to name the elements. And so it was done all automatically for me. I didn't have to do any creative regex stuff. So that's a good thing because really nobody likes to do regex stuff. Let me activate the script. Again, our familiar inputs.conf. This time we're going to say script, and we're just going to give it the part to the name of the shell script we made that's going to run it. And then uh, we can turn them on and off. Um, so maybe only run on them temporarily. So in case you know, I just want to do it once a month, you know, especially if I'm on a 500 meg a day demo license and I can't really afford to turn all of my stuff on, maybe I want to rotate throughout you know, the day or so which ones I want to look at. I can just put enable disable to true, and it would not it would not start. But it would still be there, so I, would, I wouldn't have to delete it and keep multiple versions of my inputs.com file. I can just put things as enabled or disabled as I want. That's kind of handy. Again, I'm going to tell it what host uh, I want to take it from. Um, if I didn't put this in, it would be the actual name of the machine. So again, I can I can name them when I want. Uh, if I wanted to, I could, you know, if I had two RMAN hosts on different machines, I could name them both RMAN hosts and just make it look like one to Splunk. That's how you want to catalog stuff. That's what you can do. So then I'm telling it the interval, and then I'm going to name the source type. I'm going to call it an RMX for my demo. I call it RMAN1, so there's a little typo here, but uh, we all get the point. Okay, so again, just to resurface what we did, since I showed it, I showed it briefly, but we'll go into some live demos again going over this and showing how it works and kind of doing a recap on what we've done. So I'm going to flip over to my Splunk screen here. And wait a second. So again, I always like to show this a little bit after I've done my first explainer because you kind of have to go back and forth a few times for things to get more gelled. So now that you saw how it got in there, now you can see why it looks like what it does. So oh, my little mouse cursor went away again. There we go. Sorry, guys, I lost my arrow. So again. It's coming from one host because I named it RMAN so host. Um, the source type is RMAN, like we named it. And then here's all the fields that Splunk automatically extracted for us, um, like backup type. So L is archive log files, D is full backup, and I is incremental backup. So if I wanted to do a chart of how many level zero full backups I'm doing, I could do that. I could very easily do that and see again it. It put the search language up there, and it uh, shows me how to write a report by doing drill down. So again, the more you use it, the more you the more you'll learn. So if I'm interested in how many are for ERPQA, then we could do that. So we could begin drilling down again. Uh, if I wanted to take a look at the source, extract the fields. Next, so again, I'm showing you, I'm kind of building you on the fly how the interactive tools are. You can enter the regex, which Splunk will try and help you with, or you can, if you know it's delimited, you just tell it's delimited. I can pick comma, and there we go. So again, this is a live version of this is the exact same slide I showed you before, where Splunk has already went and pulled out and getting in all the data. And if I hit OK again, it will save it to the column name. So right now, for testing purposes, it's sealed one, two, three. So then, this is where you get to take a look and make sure that all of your stuff is doing it. So here's what Splunk gets in, the raw data, and here's what it did after it's done parsing. And so you have some interactive tools here to where you can make sure that your, that your extractions are working correctly and roll them into your reports. So that's pretty easy and pretty powerful. And you, know, you can take your, favorite, take your favorite scripts that you normally use for health checks, roll them into Splunk, and then you can get graphical reports 
uh, of your favorite health checks that, that you could actually save over time and, and take a look and see how, how, you know, how your system's been going. Well, back to... So, Splunk installation requirements. You're getting a little short on time here, so I want to get through this. Um, Splunk can be downloaded for free. You'll be limited to 500 of ingested data per day, which is actually pretty sufficient if you if you had like you know an application server or a database server, maybe even both if you if you were again judicious on what what you picked that you wanted to log. Um, the best way I think to get started is doing the uh, the Nix platform and a tarball, which is you can put it anywhere you like. Um, again, it's stored in, in self-contained path, so you don't have to have root to do it. It won't put anything in init.d. It won't put anything in etsy or lib or anything like that. So your sysadmin uh, doesn't have to get all nervous about it. Um, you can also install Splunk on, on the system you wish to monitor. Um, if this is a system that, that's having issues, you may not want to put it on there because obviously you know Splunk does take some resources to do the reporting and and whatnot so you want to be careful about you know putting it on a system that's already having trouble because the Splunk reports will come back slow now the indexing and stuff the collection is not really that intensive so um, I've had plenty of opportunities to monitor how much bandwidth the collection of it does but then when you start doing reporting um, Splunk will grab a processor and go to town with it because it's doing a lot of heavy stuff. So um, you might not get the best results if you have Splunk on the system you're, exa you're monitoring. Um, and again, just for notes, that Splunk uses port 8000 and higher, so you do, again, you don't need to have root uh, to, to use it. So Splunk will communicate with itself via 9000. That's what the, the that's what the forwarders will use a port over 9000. Uh, to send back to the indexer and all the web stuff that Splunk is doing is on port 8000. If you have Splunk existing, um, there's a few things that you can ask your Splunk admin. Um, I would suggest your own index. So the index, as we said before, is the is actually the directory structure that contains the Splunk files that are storing the data. It's not a database index like you would normally, you know, think of. So it's it's just a collection of the files that Splunk uses uh, to do the reporting off of. Um, I would ask for additional forwarders on your system. So if your server has a forwarder on it, all you really need to do is have your stanzas added for inputs.conf to your scripted inputs or the, the directories of the log files that you want. Um, and then the other thing I would ask for is your own application. Um, an application in Splunk, it's, it's just a collection of settings like searches, charts, reports, descriptions, etc. cetera. Um, it's not a binary application. Again, it's, it's more like prepackaged configs. And so you get your own charts, your own regex extractions, all that stuff will be saved under your application so you're not accidentally you know, um, rewriting someone else's or sticking a bunch of stuff in, you know, um, you know, for the network guys to figure out what that is and they might delete it. So just a way to keep things organized. Um, and again, that's what Splunk's pretty powerful about, letting you compartmentalize uh, its data and the things that generate it, like, like the, uh, like the application, so you know, um, because it's a it's an all-in-one tool, it, it can monitor pretty much every facet of your whole IT infrastructure. So you can you can also use it to keep all that stuff organized and, and out of each other's way. So um, that, having your own application would be very helpful, uh, just so you you guys aren't gonna get into trouble with with your network and security guys. So now. At the end, I'm going to pass it over to Stephen to answer some of the questions we have collected. Stephen? Thank you, John. At this point, uh, we are going to take questions from our viewers today. And the first question, can Splunk be integrated with other monitoring tools? Yes, yeah, Splunk can be integrated with other monitoring tools. Um, one of the familiar things that, that we do with our clients is, is a lot of them will have OEM um, uh, Oracle Enterprise Manager as well, and Splunk does have some overlap, but it's more of a tool to tell you where to look at OEM. 
um, so Splunk is the macroscopic because um, you know, we can look at all the databases at once where OEM is a little clunky to do that. Splunk also has JSON and REST APIs so you can directly send data back and forth or use Splunk you know, indexing and searching to provide data to some other tool that you have it. So yeah, Splunk has, a, has quite a toolbox of things to help you integrate and federate all of your, all of your searching into one platform. Thank you. Next. Understood. Our next question, what is the licensing model for Splunk? We talked a little about that before, and that, that's often a confusing question. So the, the, the free license is 500 megs a day across the indexers. So Splunk, again, does not care how much data you end up storing or, or how long you want to store it for. It only cares about how much data is it indexing and putting into its proprietary files for the search to use. So free version comes with 500 megs a day, which is more than enough to get your feet wet on to see if it can help you out. And then you can go out from there, from a gig a day, 5 gigs, 10, 50 gigs, um, so on and so forth. Understood. Our next question, does Splunk only run on Windows, or can it be run on any operating system? Splunk can pretty much run on any operating system. Well, okay, not a not AS400, but any version of Linux, Unix, Solaris, uh, Ubuntu, it runs on Mac, um, and it runs on Windows. So both the forwarders and the Splunk system itself, you know, showing the, the search head and whatnot, can, and can run on all of the major platforms. Understood, John. Is there a way for Splunk to run queries on the database rather than exporting an output from the actual database? Yes, and again, that's that's a good question, and that's that's what we talked about with our RMAN demo. Um, you could actually have it run scripted inputs um, using your favorite health check scripts. Um, and you can have it, you know, make interactive reports for all of your favorite health check scripts and save over time. So yes, absolutely, you don't have to export. So that scripted input data never made it into a file. It was never a file to be indexed. It was standard out right to Splunk. Understood. That is all the time we have for questions today. I'd like to thank our speaker today, John Kennan, Senior Oracle EBS DBA at DataVail. If you would like to review this presentation or send it to a colleague, please use the same URL that you used for today's live event. It will be archived. And if you would like a PDF of this presentation, you can click on the resource icon at the bottom of your console. Thank you for joining us today.